Welcome to Zero Knowledge, a podcast where we explore the latest in blockchain technology and the decentralized web. The show is hosted by me, Anna. And me, Frederick. In this week's episode, I sit down with Jenna Zank from Melonport. She's the CTO there. And we're going to discuss the path this company took and what it means to release a protocol into the wild. So before we start, we'd like to say thank you to this week's sponsor, Neufund. Neufund is building an ERC-20 compatible open source platform, enabling tokenization of real world assets. Neufund implements protocols that bind off-chain assets with on-chain representation. In this episode, we do touch on ETOs or security tokens, so this is kind of relevant to that. So if you're interested to see how Neufund has linked legal documents with smart contracts, check out their GitHub profile at github.com slash Neufund, or join them on their Telegram channel. Links, as always, are in the show notes. And now, here's our interview with Jenna. Hi, Jenna. Hi, Anna. <laughs> how you doing? Good, and you? Very good. I'm here with Jenna Zenk, who's the CTO of Melonport, and we're here in Sug. Uh, just a few days after we wrapped M1, the asset management 3.0 conference that Jenna and the Melonport team put together and that I got a chance to host, which was super fun. Jenna, I think, as we always do, I think the best start is a quick introduction. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. First of all, thanks for having me. I'm really excited uh, for this uh, podcast because I listen to the podcast, all of the episodes. So it's definitely one of my favorites. So um, yeah, I'm Jenna. I've been working on the Melon project for two years now. But before that, I was actually working in finance, in traditional finance. I was working in the hedge fund industry in New York. Um, and then I decided to stop and to learn programming and um, to actually become a developer. I have been in the crypto space before learning programming out of personal curiosity and interest. And then I started actually working in the space two years ago. So you made this pretty dramatic shift in your career. What inspired you to do that? So I've always wanted to learn programming. Like this is, this always attracted me. Um, I started in a business school, studied finance, a lot of mathematics and coding was definitely something that I wanted to do at some point. But then I started working in the hedge fund industry right after graduating. So being in the crypto space and reading a lot and attending a lot of conferences and meetups kind of like gave me this extra push to be like, okay, now I actually want to get a more technical background so that I can understand things in a deeper manner. Do you think that's actually important for people entering in the space that they put in the work to understand the tech? I think it depends what are your goals by entering the space. I think you can definitely understand a lot of things without being an engineer. Uh, there are a lot of resources out there available for anyone to do a lot of reading. And quite frankly, like I've spent maybe three years reading about crypto without, you know, having a technical background and that was totally fine. Uh, but I would say if you feel the need to understand deeper, then yes. Let's talk more about how you actually got into blockchain because that happened before mm -hmm. you actually got into programming. Yeah. What first, what was your first contact with the space? So I think it was like in 2012 or 2013. And um, I was just generally interested in different technologies and just reading about new things that, um, that were coming out. But I was particularly interested in technologies that were that could empower people or, you know, give more control over data or privacy or economic power. And uh, so I came across Bitcoin at the time, which I found very interesting. So I got involved a little bit, like nothing crazy. I got involved. I was following the space by afar, you know, for maybe two years. And then I think it was in 2014 when we started speaking about Ethereum, that's when really I could see what I could do, you know, because when it was Bitcoin, I couldn't see what I could myself do. Uh, but Ethereum was like this promise of a platform where we can actually build smart contracts. So th contracts that can do things uh, that opens up a whole lot of new opportunities. So 
from that point on, I was completely hooked. And that's when I started like kind of reading all night longs about what was going on. So you sort of fell into the wormhole. What do we call it? The, rabbit the vortex, hole. the rabbit yeah. hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I was working, I was working in hedge fund. So, you know, I had a full-time job, but all of my, um, weekends and nights like I would like read everything attend all of the meetups uh in the US and France that were happening and yeah and then when I was actually able to program I was like I actually want to work in this space um and then I met um Mona in the f the first EdCon in Paris 2017 um and it was kind of like obvious that what she was trying to do uh was very relevant for what I've been doing being asset management, but also being very involved in crypto and uh, beca becoming a developer. Let's talk a little bit about Melon, the protocol, the project, and Melonport, the company. Let's go back to that first meeting with Mona. Did Melonport already exist when you joined or was it just an idea? Yeah. So when we met at EdCon, actually Mona and George uh, Hallam were there and they had just completed the token take like a few days before, like maybe four oh, wow. or five days before. And so they were actually starting to look out for uh, building a team. And, um, and that's how we connected. So you, so you actually joined post ICO. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, what was the project at that time? Like, what did you join? So I joined a project that had a very ambitious goal, which was building an infrastructure for asset management on the Ethereum blockchain, which at the time, quite frankly, there was not many complex protocols being built there, right? A lot of things were being built, but it was very early. So even in terms of tooling, it was a big challenge, I would say, but just the idea of using Ethereum to disrupt the industry that I was working in, cool. because I've seen those inefficiencies myself. So that's, that's the idea that I joined. So you met Mona in Paris mm -hmm. at EdCon. Yeah. And then, but you weren't living in Paris. Where were you living? I was living in New York, but I'm originally from Paris okay. and I flew from New York to Paris for the EdCon conference because it was one of the first, um, big Ethereum conference, except, I mean, separate from DEF CON. So I definitely flew for that, for that, you know, I just came for a few days and the day that we met, I was flying back to New York the next day. So what happened right after that? Like, were you... Did you just pick up from New York? Yeah, and... yeah. We just, um, you know, we just got on a few calls um, the following days um, from New York, between New York and Zurich. Um, I had personal plans to move to LA before that, but my plans got changed and I actually moved uh, to Zug, Switzerland. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, that's like a big life changing yeah, decision yeah, right unexpected. there. Unexpected. Um, cool. But, but I, I would say it was, it does sound like a very like big shift. But at the same time, you know, when, when an idea just clicks for you and you know, okay, that, that's what I want to do. Um, you, you just know it because for me, I have been spending maybe eight months, not, I was not working. I was not, um, studying in a school or anything. I was just like reading about Ethereum and attending conferences. And I was waiting for this moment where, okay, I would find a project that, okay, that, that really passionates me, either find a team who is working on that or have an idea by myself. Right. Um, but the minute I spoke with George and Mona, it was like, okay, this is it. It was very obvious for me. And I think for them, um, my background was very obvious because they were looking for developers, but I also had the kind of like asset management background and financial, uh, having, having studied finance. Do you think that that, the fact that you switched, like, I think some people feel that when they're studying, they should be studying exactly what they're going to do. And if they decide to switch at some point that it could be like a setback, but it sounds like in your case, it was like additive. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, I've been, you know, I've been saying that for a long time to people around me, friends, um, relatives. I think, I think what you study doesn't really matter if you, uh, end up realizing that there's something else is what you want, you want to do. It's, I think it's always possible, especially in our times now where you have a lot of online resources to learn about anything, but you also see uh, new education models where uh, you can go in a school or a bootcamp for like, you know, four to six months, very intense, but 
you know, study something completely new and come out of this and being able to work in, in this new industry. So that's what I've done. Like I went to a programming bootcamp for like four months, very intense. But after that, I was able to, you know, build an application by myself and, uh, and then, and also learn any other programming language by myself. So I think I would encourage actually anyone to switch if they feel the need to switch. And in my case, it was very helpful. So let's dig deeper into Melon mm -hmm. and this protocol. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned it's sort of, at least for, from your background, it's a great mix of like the tech and the asset management, mm -hmm. the financial services side. What is it exactly? So um, the Melon protocol is an open source protocol built on top of Ethereum. It is a set of smart contracts that implements the behavior of an investment funds. So what this means is that it lets you do on-chain asset management. So the way you can think about it today, when you have a hedge fund, you're, you're you know, on Wall Street managing your hedge fund, dealing with all of the intermediaries uh, around you. And what we're building is something to let you exactly do the same thing, you know, from your apartment uh, and powered by the Ethereum blockchain. So it is an open source protocol for on-chain asset management. And it lets people create um, investment funds on the Ethereum blockchain and manage those funds completely on-chain. Is this only for crypto trading? Like, are the assets managed always crypto? So in V1 um, that we're rolling out in a couple of days or weeks from now, you have access to uh, ERC-20 tokens. So tokens that exist, assets that exist on the Ethereum blockchain. But the plan is definitely in future versions to open up the asset universe. And that comes with interoperability. When we have those capabilities, we can then have Melon funds that manage more than just assets existing on Ethereum. And so that would be other blockchains. But do you think yeah. it will ever go into the real world? Like maybe even yeah. with like 721s, like if so, they're representative of like real world assets, could that live in? Yeah. So I would say that one of our very important assumption here when building Melon, we're not building this just for the crypto space. We're building this for the asset management industry as a whole. And our assumption is that all the assets that we know of today will be tokenized in a form or, or another, on a blockchain or another. It doesn't matter where and when, but it, we think that in the next five years, most of the assets will be tokenized. And we're already seeing this. Uh, you have a lot of people planning to do ETOs or STOs, security token offerings. So these are actually assets, like shares of a real company in the real world. Uh, that, that are represented on the blockchain. You also have people like Digix who are tokenizing gold. Um, you have real real estate being tokenized. So it is definitely happening. It takes some time, but I think in a couple of years from now, you can probably manage any asset that exists in the traditional financial industry cool. uh, in a million fund. What does the protocol actually like look like? What are the pieces of this protocol? The protocol is composed of two layers. So the first layer is the fund layer. So those are all of the smart contracts related to the funds operation. So the way we have built it is in a very modular way. So when you actually create a fund, what you're really doing, you're just deploying a bunch of contracts, maybe seven or eight contracts. And each contract is doing one thing uh, and is trying to do it the best The, in the best possible way. So you have a contract that is managing the accounting of the fund. You have another contract that is managing the share distribution and redemption uh, for the investors. You have another contract that is responsible for uh, interfacing with the different exchanges, etc. So on this layer one, you have um, all of the contracts that power your fund. And then you have the layer two, which is more infrastructure type of contracts. So those funds can't really live by themselves. They need some infrastructure contracts. So that could be a price source. So we need prices to power the funds. It could be adapters translating the Melon terminology to the specific exchanges that we're using. We have also kind of like a registry that tracks all of the existing assets, all of the ex existing exchanges that you can uh, interact with. 
So those two layers are the melon protocol. Is there also, I mean, there's the melon protocol and then is there also like the melon product? Yeah, sure. So when we talked about the protocol, we tend to focus on on the smart contracts, but quite frankly, smart contracts by themselves are not very useful. If your end user is not a developer or a technical person, uh, you definitely need to uh, have actually a product or an interface. So what we have is um, we have what we call the, the Melon Manager interface. It is um, a desktop application that you can download from our, our GitHub and um, it just uh, it just runs on your local machine. Uh, you can connect to your local Ethereum node or a hosted node, whatever. And uh, it's like your interface to manage your fund and uh, or as an investor to invest in any fund. It's really like the, the tool set for asset managers and investors. And that is powered by a TypeScript library that we've been uh, working on, but also a quite complex data layer using GraphQL and all of that stuff. So I think you've made just a really good point. I feel like a lot of projects, especially if they're trying to interface with the quote unquote, like real world or like existing realities, um, they are going to actually have to understand that there needs to be a bridge built. And I, I guess that's what you mean by this like front end dashboard. That's, that's like a web product. Yeah, it's, I would say that our protocol is in a way very hard to interact with if you're not technical. Like I, I can't see a manager actually interacting directly with the smart contract. I mean, he would freak out immediately and never touch this product again, right? So um, what we've done is that, um, and even for developers who are not necessarily familiar with our protocol firsthand, um, it's not trivial to get started. So what we've done is that we've built the Menon TS library, which is a TypeScript library that really is, I think, very powerful because it allows you to interact with the contract without knowing anything about Solidity. So you don't have to know about writing smart contracts. Uh, it's obviously useful, but you, you could create a font using just this TypeScript library if you're a JavaScript or a TypeScript developer. Um, and when building this library, we realize like there are a lot of things that sound super trivial, but are not. So for instance, we deal with a lot of tokens like ERC20 tokens, but they all have some differences, number of decimals, for instance, sounds super, super simple. But when you actually have to multiply token A and token B or divide token A and token B, or, you know, know what token A, B and C amount for in the nav calculation of your fund, we realized it can get a little bit messy. So when building the library, we also built like side libraries, such as token math. My colleague Simon has been working on that a lot. And it's a very tiny library, but it allows you to do any interaction, uh, any calculation on tokens, regardless of if they have the same number of decimal or not. Um, it takes into account their prices. And um, I think we have, the TypeScript library is very developer friendly, but still, if you're an asset manager, you don't have to do that. So on top of that, we have the Melon Manager interface, which is a desktop application. Um, and it is, you know, the gateway for users to interact with the Melon protocol without having any um, technical knowledge. It almost sounds then like you've built you've built multiple products. Like you, you've not only had to build or ship like a, a protocol, you've also had to build like a web app and like all of the UX. And I can just picture yeah. like going through that process multiple times. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, the promise was to deliver a protocol and an interface that goes with it. But, uh, I would say that the tech stack that we have is very complete from back end to front end, back end being the smart contracts, front end the interface, but in between you have this TypeScript library that kind of like bridges and uh, a quite complex data layer uh, that is using GraphQL, but also we found that we had to uh, aggregate order books from exchanges. So we have a library that does just this. Um, yeah, the tech stack is quite complete. Um, and what we've been building for two years definitely was not only just a set of smart contracts and the team that we have, you would see two smart contract only developers 
and three JavaScript and uh, front-end developers and a designer. So, you know, it's the quite full even. gamut, basically. Yeah, yeah. So I imagine, like, in the development of the front-facing, the user-facing platform, there's so many libraries, there's best practices, like, you know, Web 2.0 is quite well uh, traveled mm -hmm. and it's, you know, there's a lot you can just, you can draw on from previous work, but with the protocol level stuff, there's a lot of unknowns. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about what you came into contact with and maybe like, what were the challenges for your specific use case? Sure. Um, I would say the first challenge that we've encountered in the first few months of development was the lack of tooling. That was a, a big one. And uh, we ended up building a lot of the tooling ourselves of what we needed. Um, but that was just in the first few months because then uh, Ethereum developer base like kind of grew massively. And, uh, and I think today we have a lot of toolings around what we're trying to do. So um, for our current or remaining challenges, um, the first one are the Oracle question or in our specific case, how to get uh, prices on chain. So if you're doing asset management, you need a way to be able to evaluate your funds to calculate the NAV, which is the net asset value of the fund, because that metric is used for everything else, the share price, the management, uh, the performance fees that are paid out, etc. And um, it's funny, but you know, the blockchain doesn't know about what the price of this asset is. And we have to find a source, a price source on chain to um, be able to do what we're doing. And we found that like until now, I don't think that there is the ideal decentralized, trustless price feed uh, solution on chain. Uh, we've, you know, we've tried a couple of different approaches. Um, and I think we came to a point today that we're happy with what we have, but definitely there can be better things uh, done. And ultimately, I think in the future, the price source um, on chain will come from decentralized exchanges. The reason why we can't really do that today is uh, because of the lack of volume traded and the lack of liquidity on decentralized exchanges. So you don't get the price accuracy that you would need for valuing investment funds. Well, and that would be problematic. That would be definitely problematic. Can we, I don't think we've ever actually defined this on the podcast, but how would you define an oracle? Okay, so an oracle is a way to put on chain uh, real world information. So the blockchain, if you don't tell the blockchain, it doesn't know about what's the weather outside, what is the result of this election, what is the price of this asset, um, what is the level of the S&P 500 and all this type of information that we have access so easily you know, just by going on your uh, web browser. All it knows is like a block number. Yeah. And it, it just knows about its current state and its self state. And that's it. It doesn't know about anything external unless you bring it. So an Oracle is something that brings data on chain. This data usually is, is useful for all of the applications that live on, on the blockchain. Now, you can have, it, it's actually quite easy to have an Oracle that brings prices. So I can just, you know, have a smart contract and push prices every morning at 8 a.m. I can do that, but it is kind of centralized and I'm like a single point of failure. So the real challenge here is to have a decentralized or rather trustless price source because if one person or a set of persons can actually manipulate the prices that they put on chain, then the results of that can be quite dramatic, especially um, for financial applications. What would be the equivalent of an oracle in sort of traditional financial worlds? Well, we would use like, you know, official price sources. Um, you can get prices from Bloomberg, from Reuters. You know, it's, it's, it's so trivial to get this information in the real world. It's so not in the blockchain world. So I would say that was like one of the big challenge. So there's no Bloomberg or Reuters in crypto. And I guess all you have are kind of like, you have some centralized exchanges, but they might be reporting like very different values. So what did you do? So yeah, centralized exchanges definitely have, you know, they actually have like quite accurate prices, 
but they're not on chain, they're off chain. So what we've done, um, actually we've tried a couple of approaches. So the one that I mentioned earlier, just having a price feed contract to which you uh, push prices every so often. That's super easy, but also super uh, needing trust in the person updating prices. So then uh, we, we moved to another approach, which was a little bit more decentralized. So we had this kind of like canonical price feed, uh, which was aggregating prices from different operators on our network. So you could have like, I don't know, a hundred operators who are, who were staked in melon tokens and they would provide prices on chain. And then this canonical price feed would kind of like take the five most staked uh, operators and take the median of their prices. So that was an okay solution. I mean, it definitely worked. Uh, like we used it on the main net over the summer. It was working, um, but it was just like very complex solution for something that shouldn't be that complex and still vulnerable to price manipulation. So then what, we, what we're doing now actually came out of a discussion over the summer with Loy from uh, Kyber. Uh, we're about to integrate Kyber as one of the decentralized exchanges that the Melon funds can trade on. And just by discussing with, with Loy on their approaches, uh, on their approach, we realized, okay, but actually those guys have an on-chain price. Like that is quite, that could be used in our case. So, you know, they were live for like three months at this point. And uh, so I was like, in the past three months, like, do you know what, what is the price deviation? What is the deviation between your prices that you've had on chain and prices that we can find on a centralized exchange? And uh, he said, it's very small. It's like around 1%. And I was like, I can't believe this. Like, I really could not believe it. So what we've done is actually we've done our analysis. Um, we've been... Uh, we ran a script that, that, that started at the, the inception of the Kyber network. And we checked for, you know, different points in, in time, uh, every day for like six months. I mean, the three months, but now we, we were, we run it recently for like the six months. Um, so we take a price at a certain point in time that is on Kyber, right? On chain. And we compare it with an average price that we get from different centralized exchanges. And, um, I have to apologize for, to him. Um, I mean, I've already done personally, but yes, it's true. Uh, price deviation is around 1%, 1.5%, which for a decentralized exchange is very impressive. Now, the reason for that is Kyber is not really a typical decentralized exchange. It is rather a network of what, what they call reserve managers. And those reserve managers bring liquidity to the network. So they have assets that are on chain that are kind of like an inventory. And what they do is that they set a spread. So they set a price at which they would sell melon and a price at which they would buy melon, right? And they kind of like readjust this price every so often, I think every two minutes or so. Um, so because of that, the prices are quite, you know, they could be more accurate, but for for blockchain, I think it's the, these are the best on-chain prices that you get in a trustless manner because no one can really manipulate th those prices except for the reserve managers themselves. But if they do that, they put their inventory at risk. So game theory, from a game theory perspective, is quite interesting what Kyber has been building. And we decided, okay, this is our price source. Um, we're just, you know, we're getting prices from Kyber. Uh, we're definitely... Now relying on another, uh, on an another network, on another project, which is quite interesting because we took this decision. We're like, okay, if we do that, uh, we are relying on Kyber. It's something that we're willing to accept. So it's one of the uh, assumptions of our model is Kyber is working and Kyber is quite resistant to, to attacks. So pr finding the price and figuring out what something's worth is one of the big challenges. What else would you say is a challenge? So the other thing that was quite challenging is, you know, putting a lot of things on chain because our whole protocol is running on chain, right? So um, we put a lot of 
data on chain and also some of the features that we have require quite uh, heavy computation. So um, I would give as an, as an example, um, risk management and risk engineering. So basically, um, when you have a melon fund, you're an asset manager, you can manage your portfolio. Uh, but if that's all you knew, you could, you know, theoretically embezzle funds. So what we have is a risk management, or rather we call it a risk engineering component that actually protects the investors from the asset manager potential malevolent behavior. And th these are just rules that the manager chooses at, at the fund creation time. So he can say, look, um, I will never trade this obscure asset, right? I will never have this asset in my fund, or I will never trade at prices that are over 5% away from the actual price given by the price source, or I will never have uh, a concentration in this asset of more than 10%, these type of things. So these are rules. And um, what we do is that when a manager tries to trade, like to sell an asset or to buy an asset, uh, we eva evaluate those rules that, you know, evaluate to true or false. If it evaluates to true, the trade is accepted so it can happen. But if it evaluates to fault, it will just not happen. But in risk engineering, you have things that are a little bit more complex than, you know, asset whitelist or asset blacklist or price tolerance. You have things like volatility and actually in, in the real world, this is a core thing in risk management is volatility of your portfolio. But if you want to measure the volatility of your portfolio after you buy this asset, you actually need a long historical record of data that really we shouldn't be putting on chain. So that's definitely one of the challenge. Um, so you need that data and then you need to perform a kind of like heavy computation. I mean, not so heavy, but like for blockchain, it's already heavy uh, computation at this point on chain. So what we've done is that we've implemented all of the rules that are not um, so heavy in computation, but uh, in the future, we'll have to find solutions for the risk engineering rules that are more uh or more demanding. And so here, what you're saying is like, you're going to need some sort of off-chain computation or some, or the on-chain needs to be faster or more, yeah. <laughs> have more capability. <laughs> um, so because right now it sounds like you've put like a minimal rule set or minimal kind of like the bare bones of what can make the protocol run, but what you'd want to do would be bigger. Yeah. I mean, we've identified like t about 12 rules that would be like really an ideal tool set for a manager. And we've implemented five of them. Some of them can be implemented now. Some of them require either an off-chain solution um, or, or better capabilities on-chain. Now, the thing is, um, there are a few things that we've uh, looked into. We're going to be considering Substrate in the future. And um, from Gavin's talk during M1, um, it seemed like being on Substrate could help solving this issue where we could actually offload some of the uh, heavy computation and also offload some data storage. So that could be uh, something that could work. Um, the other things that we have considered and discussed um, with Matt Differente, our security uh, reviewer, is maybe using, um, using, using different operators that can actually do, do those risk engineering checks off chain and submit a zero knowledge proof uh, on chain to you know prove that this trade was accepted because it was compliant with the risk engineering uh, rules that the fund had. Oh, cool! You're coming into our <laughs> neck of the woods. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and so given that it's a smart contract based protocol, you'll always have the question of smart contract security and. I'm wondering, like, where are you at with that? I mean, I don't think it's new. I don't think it's unique to any project in the space that this is an issue. But like what, given that you're managing, that you have a protocol that's managing money and not like, I don't know, like fun game in game stuff. Like I could just imagine security in this case being like a very high priority. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, you were talking about the challenges that we've had. Smart contract security is definitely the biggest one, I would say, because all of these other problems are 
solvable uh, when when you have enough time to put in there. But smart contract security is interesting and has been uh, one of our priority in the past and will be uh, will stay uh, one of our priorities in the future. So. You know, the way we deal about this is very similar to other projects, I would say. Uh, we kind of like double down on security audits. Um, we've been having security audits since the very beginning. Uh, I mean, like the first version of the smart contracts that has like nothing to do with the contracts that we have today was audited probably by two independent auditors. So we've been like doing regular security audits with different and independent uh, parties. So more recently for the upcoming V1, we've been uh, audited by three independent uh, auditors. But what we've found, uh, maybe a lesson learned from other projects, is that it's good to have security audits at a point in time, but you have to remember that it's an audit at a point in time of your code base. And um, the, the whole process of onboarding a security auditor uh, that do their analysis, report their results, and all of that is, of course, extremely valuable. But what I found even more valuable is that uh, we've had the chance to uh, work with uh, Matt Differente actually on a weekly basis. So he's been our security expert and reviewer since the month of July. And having someone who looks at your code base and your smart contracts from a security angle every week is extremely, extremely helpful. Now, it's actually very hard to find because they're, um, I mean, security auditors are, you know, not very available. But for us, this has been, I would say, a game-changing methodology for smart contract security. Having to explain what, we, what we've done every week and what we plan to do and getting his feedback, that was great. And also, when we come like closer to V1, he's going to be producing his final report but for him, it's like he doesn't have to learn about the whole code base in a week or two. He actually knows it. He knows all of it already. He's just going to produce the final report. So I think having that, uh, maybe a security expert in-house or having someone that works a few hours a week with you, that was extremely helpful. Now, despite all of the audits that we've had um, and all of the measures that we've taken, bug bounties, live bug bounties, all of that, um, the, the risk zero does not exist, obviously. Um, and in the future, we definitely want to explore uh, things a little bit more like formal verification, or at least um, in the coming months, I think we'll be formal, formally specifying the protocol. Um, and my feeling is that just the fact that we're going to be really specifying the whole protocol in details in another language, that could, that could potentially help finding things that we haven't you know, found so far. Do you think that that is sort of the future of protocol development where it's not going to be like build something, get audited, release into the wild, but rather like an ongoing process of like there needs to be a security auditor on mm. hand? I would say that if you're building uh, financial related protocols or things, something that manages money, definitely, yeah. And I would just add on that that also... It seems like a lot of auditors are actually um, moving toward that, that kind of like new model of smart contract security. So when they were before uh, offering services for, okay, here is the quote for one audit right now on your code base, right? Uh, m more of them are actually moving toward a model where they could be, you know, consulting with you for uh, X amount of time. So it looks like it's going there, yeah. I guess also in the past, a lot of the security audits were on like ICO contracts. They weren't on like real yeah, yeah. complicated, it's different. innovative <laughs> yeah. smart contracts. Yeah. So I feel like I definitely have a good understanding of like the tech, but now I want to hear a little bit more about what is happening now. Melon is a protocol that's about to be kind of released into the wild. So that's what I want to talk about. Um, maybe to start though, let's go back to this, the beginning of the project. Mm -hmm. What was the plan for the Mellon protocol early on? Yeah. So, uh, back in February, 2017, the kind of like official beginning of the project where the token sale happened, um, Mellon port AG, a private Swiss based company was mandated, uh, for the development for the two years development of 
the Melon Protocol V1. So that is the company that I work for and that our whole team works for. And um, it was all always planned that this was a two years workshop where we would build the V1 of the protocol and the interface that goes with it. Um, now the project, the whole two years workshop was kind of like split into uh, two, three phases and phase three, which was, which started back in July, uh, was about uh, governance. So if this company is not going to exist after February, 2019, how, you know, how are future decisions going to be made? How is, what is going to happen to the protocol? Who is going to be maintaining it? What, who is going to be, you know, pushing upgrades and all of that. So all of those things that have to um, ultimately have to do with governance. So um, as you mentioned, um, we're now in February, 2019, and the protocol is about to be kind of like released into the wild. Um, during DEFCON 4, we presented the governance model. So how it's going to look like with the Mellon Council and all of that stuff. And a couple of days ago during M1, we unveiled the initial Mellon Technical Council members. So what is the Technical Council? Right. So maybe before explaining the Technical Council, I'm just going to give a quick lowdown on the Mellon Council. Um, so the Mellon Council is a body that is going to be responsible for making future decisions on the Mellon Protocol, uh, decisions such as protocol uh, upgrades, but also uh, resource allocation. So we have an inflation pool every year. How are we going to be spending that on which developers, which teams, which projects, and so on and so forth. Uh, and a few others, um, protocol-related decisions. Now this um, Mellon Council is... What is unique about it is that it's composed of two subgroups. The first subgroup is the Mellon Technical Council, which is composed of, as you might expect, technical people. Um, it could be developers, but it could be just really anyone who has technical expertise on the Mellon protocol or related protocol that the Mellon protocol interacts with, or really expertise relevant to the decisions that are going to need to um, to be made. So the initial members of that technical council have been appointed by the outgoing Melanport team. We unveiled the eight members last week. And um, in the future, this council can grow. So anyone who has expertise, relevant expertise, can apply uh, to, uh, to get on that council. And then the whole council will vote on including a new member or not. Now, the second subgroup um, is probably what is the most unique about it, I would say, is what we call the MEB, Melon Exposed Businesses. And that is the subgroup that represents uh, the interests of the users of the Melon Protocol on that council and make sure that the needs um, of the users are going to be addressed. So what we have here is what we call a skill-based and user-centric governance model, where you have users on that council who can say, here is what we need, here is here are the things that should be prioritized. Um, but those users are not necessarily technical, and here they are actually supported by a set of extremely talented and knowledgeable uh, people. Just to go a step back, this is actually a question that I that I have is, what is the reason for setting it wild? Like, what's what's the purpose of not continuing to maintain it? as melon port. Mm -hmm. I guess melon, the melon protocol was always meant to be a decentralized, um, permissionless protocol. And we believe that, uh, if you have one company behind a protocol that is responsible for everything and that everyone relies on, then that's not what you have. Because if this company disappears, then your protocol is kind of like, left um, abandoned somehow so um, this is not to say that we're going to like stop maintaining obviously we'll be involved but we want to make it so that the Menon protocol you know it's almost like it could not it could live without us um, being involved so it's just really a will to to make things you know as they should be decentralized do you think that in a way what you're saying is like the Mellon protocol could become part of some bigger like shift in financial services like is that part of why you would do this to to say like because somebody might take the melon protocol and actually go in a very different direction with mm -hmm. it yeah 
So I would say it's definitely kind of like in the open source mindset, which we all uh, have very close to our heart here at, at Melonport. But as you said, very, you know, spot on the idea here or like the vision is that Melon um, will become the kind of like infrastructure for asset management as a whole. So not only in crypto, but in the traditional finance world. So kind of like the back backbone for asset management. And um, this is a obviously very ambitious NDA if you're right. And we believe that it can only reach that goal if we open up the development to other groups because you know we've had we have our vision, uh, we have our expertise, but there are a lot of people out there who could add so much value to what we're building. So uh, that's the idea behind it. So you've created this council, and the council's job is sort of to continue to look out for its um, well-being, I guess. Mm -hmm. But how are the users and the asset managers? kind of needs reflected in that? Like, how do you link that then? The MEB subgroup, the Melon Exposed Businesses, the way it works is if you're a user on Melon, um, you can prove that you're a user on Melon uh, based on the assets under management that you have on, on the network. So what we say is, um, provided that you have X percent of assets manage asset under management on the Melon network, you are de facto a man on exposed business, whether you want it or not, uh, you might, you know, do something about it or not. That's up to you, but you are entitled to that right. And what this, uh, the, the right that this gives you is to elect, um, the MEB representatives, um, who are going to sit on the council. Because obviously we can't really have all of the users in the same room with the men and technical council. So they have to elect representatives, um, to sit on the council together with the men and technical council uh, to make those decisions in the future. So one thing that we haven't really mentioned is the Melon token. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you mentioned that there had been a token sale before you mm -hmm. joined and yeah. Mona had done that. When, when was it done, actually? It was in February 2017. Okay. It's so like two years ago. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, or I mean, there would have been, I imagine, a ton of investors who bought the Melon token. Mm -hmm. Are these investors also the asset managers? So um, it's hard to say who are the people owning uh, Melon tokens, but um, you know there are a lot of crypto funds out there, and I would expect that some crypto funds uh, do uh, have Melon token or are exposed to the Melon token. Uh, so to that extent, they're they're you know Melon token holder and potentially future users because. As I said, Melon aims at being the infrastructure for asset management, but the very first uh, natural users would be crypto funds. First, I want to understand, how does the Melon token actually factor into all of the smart contracts in the protocol? So I'd like to start by saying that the Melon token has nothing to do with governance, and this is really important. It's completely decoupled from the governance model that we have. And what we've tried to do um, with the kind of like token uh, model, the economic token model is to provide proper economic incentives to the network. Um, so as we say, you know, the Melon protocol relies much more on future developers who are going to build new cool things on top of Melon. And the way those people are compensated is uh, by being paid in Melon tokens, where the Melon council actually allocates Melon tokens to people building on top of Melon. So um, if you're going to be paid in Melon, this Melon token better have value, right? So what we've tried to do is make sure that the value of the Melon token or the purchasing power of the Melon token uh, is linked to the usage of the network so that this aligns the interest of the developers and maintainers working on that protocol with the success of the network. So if you build something that is going to be used, um, this will factor in the value of the Melon token. Quite simply, it is a buy and burn uh, model. So when you use, so let's say you're a fund manager, uh, you create a fund and you're going to be managing your fund for the next three years. Um, when you perform certain actions on your fund, so when you call s some functions, you're going to be paying uh, asset management gas. So the same way you pay Ethereum gas when you use smart contracts, 
on Melon, you're going to be also paying asset management gas. That gas is paid um, in Ether. So we don't want to impose on the users to actually have Melon tokens so that they could interact with the protocol because that's not cool and that's not, that's like a little bit a UX uh, barrier, I would say. So you're just going to be like paying this like very, very tiny fee, almost negligible uh, in Ether. The Ether that you paid in asset management gas is going to be sent to what we call the Melon engine. And uh, this is a smart contract that receives all of the Ether collected as fee from the network. And um, that's really just two things. It um, buys up Melon tokens with the Ether that it collected from the open market. So you can come in and you have Melon token, you want to sell them, you can sell them to this contract. And this contract will buy your Melon token at a premium, which is defined according to a premium schedule based on the number of Ether uh, present in the contract. So the Melon engine um, buys up Melon and then as soon as it gets Melon, it burns it. So it acts as what you could call, I guess, a token sink. So it's a way to get Melon tokens out of circulation uh, as the network usage grows. So if, if there is one thing to take away, I guess, from this is really the Melon token is... Um, its value is linked directly with the usage of the network. So I guess that would be like a very um, high level view of the melanomics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm sure I, I know that there's a ton of blog posts that you guys have written that go that goes deeper into that. But I think on this note, though, I want to I want to bring it back to the users, these asset managers, mm -hmm. Because there was a panel at M1 that I thought was very powerful. And there was a panel that was moderated by Mona, um, which I, I guess at some point you guys are going to release these videos. I'll, we'll try to find a link to that. Mm -hmm. But I thought what was really cool about this was Mona basically asked this audience consisting of a lot of asset managers who possibly owned tokens and, and work in crypto, whether or not they would be willing to bring some of their act, their activities on chain as well through the asset management platform. And there was a few, but it was a little bit of like a strange moment where mm -hmm. this, there was this realization that like, as much as a lot of these funds like to see themselves as like taking on incumbents and being very forward thinking, they still actually follow very traditional fund formats in terms of the way that they manage mm -hmm. their actual assets. Yeah. So like they're still using, and maybe you can explain quickly what, what are they using? Sure. So uh, the crypto funds that we all know are managing a very new, a very new type of asset class, right? The crypto asset class, which is an asset class, but the current infrastructure that we have is really not adapted to the management of those crypto assets. And so those crypto funds have, you know, are kind of like taking a bet on those crypto assets. So all of those crypto blockchain protocols that, that we know about. Um, but what was interesting on this panel is they're making a bet and investing on those protocols, but at the same time, they are still very reluctant to using them, to using those protocols themselves. And in our case, it was, um, it's very interesting because our protocol is targeting those very users, those very crypto funds, uh, like we've built that for them. And, um, the reason is, as you would expect, that they are not ready or they don't feel ready to trust assets to smart contracts. So the question of smart contract security is definitely, you know, a big one have, has been a priority for us. But the what came out of this panel is that those asset managers are not comfortable with trusting assets to smart contract at this point, but not only at this point, because if I remember correctly, Mona was asking on a like 10, 10 years uh, time frame, and they were not um, comfortable with that. So um, that's definitely something that we have to work on and try to, to make them feel more comfortable. Although also on these panels, we've got a few asset managers who actually committed to um, running a portion of their funds uh, on Melon uh, in 2019. So, so that was quite cool. Um, and I think that's what we want. We don't, we definitely don't want crypto funds to go like full Melon and like put all of their assets on Melon um, next month. Um, 
but you know testing out the protocol with like small amounts progressively that's definitely the approach that we're encouraging hmm. and that was kind of like is the word dog fooding is that what people say i kind of don't like kind that of. term it is it's sort <laughs> of drinking like... your own champagne <laughs> it's another way to put it <laughs> um that was an amazing reveal though this idea that like there's these people who are investing in crypto and they'll spend a lot of time evangelizing the projects that they invest in and this mentality and the model of decentralization and this spreading of, you know, new asset classes and all of this stuff. And yet to see that room, to see that like the, the very people selling it are very, very scared to touch it was very, was amazing, but kind of, Worrying <laughs> and, and worrying that these are investors. These are the people who actually like to move from being a, an investor, like in crypto to using a platform like Melonport, it seems like not a huge leap. Whereas if mm. you're like investing in some deep protocol stuff, like off chain computation mechanisms, I understand why maybe a, an investor won't ever get hands on with those mm. types of investments. Yeah. But with with Melon, it, it was like, it's awful close. Yeah, yeah. I think it will definitely take time, which is not a bad thing in itself. Um, but there was something else that was very interesting on this panel I found is, uh, on the one hand, they are scared of trusting their assets to a smart contract um, because there is, you know, there is a chance that there will be a bug in the code and that they could lose their assets whatever happened uh, with the, the wallet hacks, the DAO hack and all of that stuff. But at the same time, on the other hand, someone in the audience, I think it was Edward for, from uh, Web3, asked um, you know, if there was a way with some sort of on-chain governance system um, to revert uh, an action if, if there was a bug in the code, uh, would that make them feel more comfortable? And the answer was unanimous, I think, on the panel. And they were saying that immutability is really important. So on the one hand, they are scared of a bug in the code that would lead to um, fund loss. But on the other hand, they are very reluctant uh, to you know, the idea of maybe reverting it. So very attached to the immutability uh, feature of blockchains. Mm. I mean, I think it was, I hope it left some of the people in the audience with a self-reflection mm -hmm. on like, is it just play money? And that's the point. And it's just like f betting on things that are kind of completely unpredictable, or is this actually investment into an ecosystem and investment into these ideas? Mm -hmm. Hope it's the latter. <laughs> Well, I think that definitely brings us to a nice place to end the interview. But I'm wondering, is there anything else that you want to share with the Zero Knowledge audience? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm very um, excited and looking forward for our V1 uh, launch later this month. And um, and also very excited about kind of like handing over officially the projects from our team to the Mellon Council that was presented to M1. So I think that's going to be cool. Well, looking forward to hearing more. And it's always a pleasure to hang out, Jenna. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks for being on. Okay. And uh, to our listeners, thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.